Hello, I am Dr. Allison Ramsey from the Department of History at the University of the West Indies St. Augustine campus. Welcome to Let's Talk History. And today we'll be doing our Kate seminar series. Our discussion is going to be on the 1876 Confederation Rebellion in Barbados with an examination of causes and consequences. The 1876 Confederation Rebellion of Barbados, Causes and Consequences. Barbados is an island in the Caribbean and is one of the most easterly islands of the region. And we can see Barbados to the far right of the map here. So we're going to discuss today Barbados and the 1876 Confederation Rebellion. And in this discussion, we're going to think a little bit first about why is Barbados important and why do we want to discuss the 1876 Confederation Rebellion? Now Barbados is one of the oldest colonies of the British Empire. It was settled by the English in 1627 and it remained a British colony. Now it is said that the Sugar Revolution began in Barbados and as a result of this we see the importance of Barbados to the sugar economy and this particular situation manifested itself where Barbados was seen as one of the most precious colonies for Britain in the 17th century. Now Barbados is divided into several parishes as we can see on this map here. And there are 11 parishes on the island. The north is St. Lucie and the city of Bridgetown is its capital in St. Michael. And at the bottom, we have Christchurch, the southern aspect of the island. We have four main towns, Bridgetown, Whole Town, Spites Town, and Oysters. So the map of Barbados and these parishes is going to be informed in the discussion of what happens in this particular rebellion. But before we get into the rebellion in post-emancipation Barbados, which means that is after emancipation takes place in 1838. We want to talk a little bit about resistance happening during the period of African enslavement. Now, the enslaved rebel both violently and non-violently, and violent resistance happened across the region. One example of violent resistance is rebellion. Now, to discuss the 1876 rebellion, we also will look at the 1816 rebellion in Barbados, which happened in April 14th of that year. Now, this was the largest 19th century rebellion in the island, and it also happened along with other rebellions, such as the 1823 British Guyana Rebellion and the 1831-32 Sam Sharp Arpris Rebellion in Jamaica. And of course, before that, we had the successful Haitian Revolution. Now, in this rebellion in the Barbados context, we have the slave elite literate slaves and free coloreds involved in this. So these are some of the names of some key players in this rebellion at the time. And the point of this rebellion was for them to gain their freedom. Bassa, who was a slave driver or ranger on Bailey's estate. Nanny Gregg, a woman from Simmons Plantation. She was very well informed about the Haitian Revolution and was one of the organizers who promoted the importance of setting fire and trying to gain their freedom as they did in Haiti. Johnny, Jackie, King Wiltshire, Dick Bailey, Washington Franklin, all were key players and Franklin was a free colored man. So we have a combination of different free colored and enslaved persons being involved in this rebellion. Now this rebellion was interesting in that they sought to attack the economy of the planter class, meaning burning down the sugar cane fields and about a fifth of the crop was said to have been destroyed. Now rebellions and running away are two of the most severely repressed um, types of resistance. And uh, this is no exception in the case of this 1816 rebellion. And we see that persons are executed, jailed, and even deported as well. Runaway and uh, rebellion was seen by the planters as against what his slavery is supposed to be, meaning that they're supposed to have total control over the movement and freedom of the enslaved. Now we have on the left, the emancipation statue, 
commemorating Bassa and his role and leadership in the 1816 rebellion. And this is a artist's view of what Bassa looked like because we don't necessarily know what he looks like. So this is a depiction that is one of our monuments in Barbados. And we have the chains where he has broken free to symbolize his effort to free himself and others as well. Now, we also have another depiction of Bassa here. As we mentioned, we don't know what he looks like on the right. And Bassa actually is one of the national heroes of Barbados, known for his involvement in this rebellion. Now, the emancipation statue is on one of our roundabouts in Barbados. Now, Bailey's Plantation is where Bassa was from, and it's in St. Philip, as we mentioned in the map before. And uh, this plantation was one of the plantations where it was very important to this rebellion where it broke out, and this plantation still exists. And we have two plaques that were placed by former prime ministers of Barbados, the honor on the Honorable Erskine Sandiford to the left, and then the Right Honorable Owen Arthur to, um, to the right. And basically, th these plaques commemorate Bassa and all the other persons that were involved in this quest for freedom. Now, as a result of these rebellions and other factors that caused the abolition of slavery, we see the Abolition Act of 1833 coming about. And this is legislation that was passed in Parliament in Britain that states that slavery would end on the 1st of August, 1834 in its colonies. Now this took place and the planters gained 20 million pounds in compensation and also a period of transition called apprenticeship was put in place to transition the society from slave to free labor. Now this period started from 1834 and was supposed to end in 1840. Now, 1838 was supposed to be the ending date for domestics and skilled slaves, and 1840 for cradle slaves who were field laborers. However, there were many problems with the functioning of the apprenticeship system, and for several reasons, it failed, and it was terminated two years earlier in 1838. And this is where we see full freedom occurring across the British West Indies. To the right, we see the Slavery Abolition Act of 1833, which states, after 1st of August, 1834, all slaves in the British colonies should be emancipated and slavery abolished throughout the British possessions abroad. So this legislation made this change possible. Now, in the discussion today, you're gonna to hear me mention several sources, such as that by Hilary Beckles, George Bell, Henderson Carter, and Michael Creighton. Now, we talked about the situation before emancipation, and we talked a little bit about emancipation. Now we're going to talk about what happens after emancipation. What is life like for the freed men and women? Now, life is very difficult because there's continued oppression. You plant a class, those who own the land, those who are in charge of the assembly, meaning the parliament and so forth, they are the ones who are maintaining the main aspects of slavery, even though emancipation has come about. They maintain racism and refuse to see blacks as free persons. And one of the things that they did was that they used legislation to curtail the movement of Barbadians and keep them tied to the plantations. Now, the planters were concerned that after emancipation, they're not going to have their, their readily available labor force. And what they wanted to do was to bind the workers to the estates and keep as low as a cost as possible to do so. Now, we see the population of Barbados being over 83,000 Blacks that are freed at emancipation. The island of Barbados is quite small, 166 square miles. Therefore, the movement of people off the plantations is not going to be shocking for the planters because they don't have anywhere to go. But instead of having a society where fair wages and fair treatment and respect would be accorded, the planters try to maintain that control through legislation to suppress them. So we see legislation such as the 1838 Masters and Servants Act, 
the contract law, which is the revised version of this. And this basically was to govern the labor relations and terms and conditions of labor. The Vagrancy Act, which controlled people's movement and the Tenantry Act, which related to housing and the Emigration Act, which related to actually migrating outside of Barbados. These were used to control Barbadians. And this meant that they necessarily did not have this true taste of what freedom was supposed to be. This institutionalized oppression continued with this whole um, concept of landlessness that we will explore. Now, what we are seeing in Barbados is that the planter class are able to maintain their monopoly over the access to land. And with freedom, the enslaved don't get anything. They are told they are free, but they are expected to remain on their plantations and continue to work for their same master. They are not given compensation as the planters were given. So they're freed, but they don't have any necessarily any opportunities to be able to advance themselves. So what we see in Barbados is a lack of progression to being able to own land. And we see as well, limited and slower development of peasant trees, which means that these peasant trees are developing along with free villages where we see independence and ownership occurring among the black population. Peasant trees meant that there's a diversification of the economy outside the sugar plantation and a lack of dependence on the planters for sustenance. Now we see in some territories like Jamaica, which were larger, that the number of freeholders, persons who own land that were Blacks, were quite substantially higher. So in the 1850s, we see about 8,000 in Jamaica with less than 10 acres of land, compared to Barbados with 818 freeholders with less than 10 acres of land. Now, part of the problem as well is that the prices of land in Barbados are extremely high and the wages are very low. So it was unrealistic for an average laborer who worked for as low as one shilling a day to be able to buy land at the price, for example, of 86 pounds per acre in 1860 and 53 pounds per acre in 1873. Now, as we discuss what was really happening that led up to this 1876 rebellion, and remember before we talked about the 1816 rebellion that happened because they wanted their freedom. So let us see why is it that they are protesting in 1876, 60 years later. Now, according to Henry Beckles, we see that there were rumors in 1876 that planters wanted to bring back slavery, abolish wages, and make them stay on the plantations. And this caused quite a stir and concern. We also see the socioeconomic conditions of the Blacks being problematic for them. In general, there's a lack of opportunity, lack of access to land, issues with wages, underemployment, unemployment, housing, and a general lack of freedom of movement. We see widespread poverty being manifested in Barbados. Now, we have those underlying causes that are related to the society and the economy, but we also have something that is a catalyst or a spark something that makes this rebellion actually happen. And at the time, it has to do with a political issue, confederation politics. Now, this refers to the attempt to implement colonial office policy. And the colonial office at the time are the ones in Britain who are in charge of what is happening in the colonies of the West Indies, for example. So they want to bring on a policy where we would have indirect rule by the imperial government, meaning Britain. And this is basically crown colony government where the British are more involved in the administration of its colonies. Now, their idea was for Barbados to form a confederation with the Windward Islands. And the Windward Islands refers to, for example, St. Vincent and St. Lucia and so forth with, the, with Barbados as the central unit. Now, we're going to just touch a little bit more on the socioeconomic conditions that were smoldering as factors for resistance. Now, after emancipation, 
the formerly enslaved are expecting fair wages, but that's not the reality. What they receive are low wages. So for example, in 1840, they received about 10 pence per day for field work. And in other islands like Trinidad and British Guyana, the wages were twice the amount, 20 to 25 pence per day. Now, in 1846 and continuing on to 1848, the wages were further reduced in Barbados to seven pence. And this, of course, is quite low. As the wages are being continuously cut and the same work demands are being placed on the freed people, this was very problematic for them because this was below their basic subsistence levels in order to survive. And we see as well, unemployment increasing and underemployment as well. Now, some Barbadians sought to, to use emigration to other territories such as those in the Windwards, British Guyana, Jamaica, and Trinidad as a way out for a better way of life. So some of them exercised this opportunity when they could. But the reality was that many remained in Barbados suffering under these poor conditions. This was also intensified by the fact that they had no political rights. Now you had to have land and a certain amount of land in order to be able to vote. Since most of the population is landless, that means the power to vote and the right to vote is in the hand of mostly white males. So they were in a situation where mostly the planter class was elected to the House of Assembly, that's the lawmaking body. Now, for example, in the same year as this rebellion in 1876, there were over 1,664 registered vote, vote, voters. And this was out of a population of 162,000. So this represented a very low percentage of the voting population of 1.02%. So we see the discrepancies and the disenfranchisement that the black working class was suffering. Now, there are other things that are happening in the society that further intensify the social and living and economic conditions of the black working class. Now, Britain implements the 1846 Sugar Duties Act. And this Sugar Duties Act says that there's no more preferential treatment for British West Indies sugar coming into the British port. It is saying that they have to compete on the same playing field as anybody else across the world. Now, this level of protectionism propped up the sugar industry in the West Indies for quite a long time. But for Britain, they determined that it was no longer economically viable and were no longer interested. So this caused some follow in the West Indies. Now, Barbados specifically suffers the 1844-1854 cholera epidemic. And during this time, about 20,000 persons died. So this was quite severe. There was also a cholera riot of 1854 relating to these poor economic conditions. Now, as time goes on, we see that due to a lack of food and opportunities to get employment, we see the rise of crime happening between 1862 to 1863. At one point of time, we see that there were over 3,000 people arrested for cradial larceny. This led to the flooding of the jails and some were pardoned to ease the pressure in the goals. In 1863, there was a drought and this drought caused more famine and more suffering. It was so bad, for example, that in 1863, there was a food rebellion in St. Philip and people were very hungry. And they heard about a wreck of a ship off the coastline near in St. Philip and they went there to find food. As a result of this, it was heavily suppressed. Now we also see this situation with famine and lack of food triggering as well the 1863 riots that took place between June and July. Later, a few years later, we see in 1872, a Bridgetown riot. And this was due to low wages and unemployment and Bridgetown is the capital, the city of Barbados. We also see the continuation of problems in terms of access to food and proper nutrition. And this is due to inflation in terms of the food prices. Now, what happened was that a lot of food was imported from America 
and the food prices became higher and higher. By the 1870s, these prices were 50% higher than in the 1860s. But we have a situation where the wages are remaining the same or they're being cut. And we even have underemployment and unemployment. So persons are facing severe economic pressure. Now, the purpose that we want to highlight of this 1876 rebellion in Barbados, according to Henry Beckles, was to overthrow the dictatorship of the planter elite and establish a society along more democratic egalitarian lines. He continues, the purpose was to uproot the great house, its class and race oppression and the determining power of white supremacy ideology. According to Henderson Carter, this rebellion was an act designed to effect change in the regime. So what both of these authors are saying is that this rebellion sought to overthrow the dominance of the white ruling elite and to try to have a society in which there was more freedom, democracy and equality. They really wanted to change what was the status quo that they had endured during the period of enslavement and afterwards in the post-emancipation society. Now this rebellion is quite important to Barbados's history and it occurs in April as well, around the same time as we note of the previous rebellion in 1816, which also happened in April. Now, this rebellion that happens in 1876 occurs 60 years after that of 1816. Now, these events, according to George Bell in 1876, were a critical juncture in the political history of Barbados and the most serious in its history. Carter notes that this was the longest rebellion in pre and post slavery Barbados. So this rebellion happened um, over a course of, of less than two weeks. Some say it started on the 17th, some say it started on the 18th, some say it ended on the 26th of April and some say the 27th, but it was over around 10 days. And this was longer than the 1816 rebellion that we mentioned with Buster, Nanny Gregg, Washington Franklin, and so forth. Now, this rebellion would have touched nearly all of the parishes of Barbados and threatened the city of Bridgetown. Now, we talked about the Confederation before, and we're going to elaborate further on this. Now, the colonial office says that they don't want the old representative system anymore of elected assemblies. Basically, this was how the colonies in Britain and the British Empire were being ruled, where they would vote um, or elect persons from within the colony to serve in the House of Assembly or the Parliament, the legislative, the council, all these sorts of different mechanisms. And of course, these people represented the landed class and were usually white male because the franchise was not extended to females of any race at all. Now, what we note is that they want to have more control, this executive authority of crown rule, instead of having the colonists in the colonies running the islands. Now, they said in their minds that the old representative system that was in place from the 17th century, in the case, for example, of Barbados, was obstructive and inefficient. So they had the plan that by 1875, there was going to be a confederation of Barbados with the Windward Islands, and there was going to be direct crown rule. Now, Jamaica resisted, for example, for quite some time. And after the 1816 Mar 1865 Martin Bay Rebellion, it became a crown colony. The Leeward Islands, such as islands like Antigua and St. Kitts, were confederated in 1871. So Jamaica has come on stream. The Leeward Islands has come on stream. Barbados was requested to comply with a confederation policy, and it did not. But the colonial office was of the opinion that this should go forward, and even though Barbados refused before, did not anticipate much political resistance to this change since Jamaica and the Leeward Islands fell into line. 
So by 1875, they decided to bring in a governor and his name was John Pope Hennessy to implement this colonial office policy of Crown Colony government in Barbados. In the view of the colonial office, this particular confederated executive system will be efficient and economical because they will be sharing human and institutional resources across Barbados and New Greenwood Islands, and there will be political representation in this free society. So they wanted to have this change. In Barbados, this news was not received um, without some contention. The ruling elite was divided on the issue. And we see coming out of this two sides of this discussion. We have the Barbados Defense Association, which is comprised, for example, of planters and merchants and civil servants, and the Confederates, which, is com which are comprised of civil servants, for example. Now, the Barbados Defense Association was of the opinion that if they lost their assembly, it meant that they would have to surrender their current rights and privileges, basically being in charge of running Barbados. And that if they gave this up, the imperial interest, that means the colonial office, Britain, would basically win. And that's not what they wanted to happen. So here we see Governor John Pope Hennessy. Now, with this situation of the ruling class divided between for and against of the Confederation, this was the first time that we see Blacks finding themselves at the center of this conflict. Now, the Black working class were of the opinion that Confederation was going to be better because any option that would break the monopoly of the planter class, their control over the judiciary, their control over the legislation, their control over the House of Assembly, their control over society and economy would give them an opportunity to have greater civil rights. They felt oppressed in all areas of life. So they were of the view that if we have a change in governance, this could help them to advance in life. But we also have a situation where some Blacks and of persons of the middle class also supported the Barbados Defense Association. Now, if the two sides against each other are not sure as the direction of where Barbados was supposed to go politically, we see that Hennessy actually goes around championing and promoting this idea of confederation to the great, you know, like to the great discernment of those who were against. But at the end of the day, Hennessy failed to implement this crown colony type of rule. And this led to the colony of Barbados being torn by rebellion and bloodshed. Now Carter tells us that unlike the riots that happened before in 1863, 1872, and 1875, this Confederation rebellion that happened in 1876 was a planned attack against the ruling oligarchy, meaning those who are in charge. So it is said that it began on the night of Easter Monday, April 17th. And by Tuesday, April 18th, the news of isolated incidents began to spread. And by the Wednesday, April 19th, it was realized that what was happening across the island was more than a potato riot, more than just trying to get food. This particular rebellion showed that planning and strategy was evident. We see that persons are gathered in groups and what they would be assembled by was by sound. So you would hear blowing of bugles or conch shells and they would come together. And sometimes what you would see is that a thousand laborers would show up and they would be divided into 10 regiments of a hundred. And they went from estate to estate, escorted by bearers of red flags. So they have sound and they also have a visual presence. Not only that, they would read a document authorizing them to rebel in the name of the governor and the confederation. Now they truly believed that the governor gave them that power and a royal order was sent to the governor telling him to give them land. Now the governor never issued any document to these rebels to these persons who were part of this resistance, but somehow something was manufactured 
And this was what they used to legitimize what they were doing. And as they went from estate to estate or plantation to plantation, they would raid the potato fields and food stuff. And not only from the plantations, but also from ships and stores and livestock were also slaughtered. Now they went to these different plantations and they armed themselves because they were prepared to, to basically attack the police if they were confronted and they had cutlasses, sticks and stones in order to do so. Now there were leaders that were identified according to Carter who would basically be in charge of certain sections of workers. And these are some of the names that he identifies. The Dutton brothers, John Price, Henry Green, Smith Baird, George Thomas, and T.T. Towley. Well, the Dutton brothers we're going to talk a little bit about, and they were cane cutters at, by the mill in St. George. They didn't work the week before the rebellion, but on April 18th, around 5 p.m., they entered the estate yard at Bide Mill demanding liquor, meaning cane liquor. And one carried a red flag and the other carried a sword. A rural constable tried to arrest them and this led to the blowing of a conch shell and that signaled the beginning of the rebellion at Bide Mill. The police were pelted with stones. Five prisoners were captured in the aftermath. Three officers were wounded. Four acres of potatoes were stolen and three cane fields were set on fire. Now, the Dottons also lead another protest. So they did one at Bide Mill in St. George, and then they are in St. Philip. So the Dottons and workers of Eastern parishes descended on Halton Plantation in St. Philip. They were armed with bills and knives and bags, and they went to the potato fields. And when they were there and they were doing their acts of, of resistance, the police arrived and right at was red. So here we have Bide Mill Great House in St. George. And here we have Halton Great House in St. Philip. Now, we see these different raids happening on different plantations, for example, Bide Mill, and we saw at Halton, plantation. Now, when this rebellion first starts, there's little intervention by the police because the governor and the inspector general of police did not think that there was a major cause for alarm. But when they realized that the situation was escalating from just raiding provision grounds to actually damaging the personal property of estate owners and threatening their lives and their families' lives, then the situation turned. Now, between April 20th to April 21, all of the troops were called from the garrison. And this is the location where the, the military was based. As a result of this escalation of violence, we see proprietors and managers were hiding. Families were abandoning their homes and they went down to Bridgetown for protection. As the rebellion continues, we see other leaders coming into the fair. And two principal military leaders that we're going to mention are General Green and Colonel Baird. Now, Green refers to J.P. Green, a 27-year-old laborer, and Smith Baird was the colonel or his second in command. As the rebellion continues to escalate, it intensifies further on Saturday, April 22nd. And we see a large number of rioters under Baird and Green attacking Applewitz Plantation in St. George. They were armed with cane knives and they attacked the great house, destroying furniture, taking portable articles, meaning different items in the house, smashing doors and windows and other types of large furniture. Now, Green was shot in the right lung by the owner of the estate during this battle, and he was sent to the general hospital as a prisoner and he died. Baird was shot and he was killed at Applewaite's estate. So the police held prisoners and we note that in the aftermath, it was estimated that three acres of potatoes and livestock were taken. The Hickson family who lived at the plantation was taken by the military to Gun Hill under escort for their safety. And here we have a photo of Applewaite's plantation. Now the rebellion continues to spread so it is in the rural areas 
and is also in the northern areas, the southern areas, and the eastern areas of the island. And we see different estates being attacked, such as Joe's River, and those in Warner's Estate, those in Graham Hall, and so forth. And the common action that we see happening in these attacks across the island were the burning of cane fields, taking of potatoes, and livestock. Now, Carter tells us that these, these workers came together in large numbers to attack these plantations. So he estimates about 2,000 workers were involved at the Bud Mill attack. At Halton, 500 to 600 workers. At Adams Castle, another plantation, 1,000 to 1,500 workers. And at Applebee's, 1,000. So the numbers of workers involved in this protest or in these protests is quite substantial. Now, most of these rioters are agricultural laborers. Some are artisans. A lot of them are unemployed, and many of them are young, between 22 and 45 years of age. But we also want to note that women were also involved in the 1876 rebellion, and some of them were plantation laborers, hucksters, and seamstresses. So we have both men and women, skilled and unskilled laborer, being involved in this rebellion across the island. Now, we also want to point out that not all of the workers would have been rioting. Some form vigilante bands to actually protect their employer's property. So we have support for the raids of the plantation and so forth. And then we have support that does not go into that, but rather protecting the planters or their employer's property by the working class. Now, during this melee as well, police constables are injured and we will see some of the numbers of injuries and wounded as well in terms of the consequences, the effects, the aftermath of this rebellion. Now, the rebellion reached a culmination point in April, on April 22nd. By then, all the stores were closed, trade was suspended, the military was dispatched. And what we also see happening is that the Bristol merchants in the city were allowed to patrol the streets with arms and were enlisted as special constables to protect Bridgetown. The rioting continues into Sunday, April 23rd. Now, some of the prisoners who are involved in this rebellion are captured and carried to the main guard, which is where the, the military was um, based, and they were tried there. As the protests escalate, we see Ashton Hall, Great House in Spite Stone, St. Peter, which is in the north of the island, was burnt. And we also see a lot of the residents of Spite Stone fleeing to Bridgetown by boat. They took refuge in several places, such as Queen's Park, in ships off of Carlisle Bay, and at St. Anne's Fort. So when they did this, they abandoned their properties and left them at the mercy of the workers. And uh, we see this movement from uh, different parts of the island to Bridgetown for safety manifesting itself mostly between April 21 and 23. Most returned home after April 25th when additional troops were landed on the island and the rebellion was on the verge of being suppressed. Now in this rebellion, we see Western, Southern, for example, parishes being affected. There were some attacks in the North and in the suburban areas of St. Michael as well. So here we have a depiction of St. Anne's Fort at the garrison St. Michael. And these are some of the military buildings that still exist at the garrison Savannah. And this is now the historic Bridgetown. It's garrison UNESCO World Heritage Site as well. Here is a depiction of Carlisle Bay in the early 19th century. And this is before the 1876 rebellion, but this was in the 19th century, just to give you a visual. So what are some of the consequences of this 1876 rebellion. In general, we see there is death and destruction. We have reported that eight Blacks died. Most were shot by the police and the military. 
Hundreds of blacks were wounded, mostly by gunfire as well. And this would, of course, take place because of the technological difference of weaponry. Now, the whites would have firepower and they would have that skill and knowledge of how to use weaponry. And we see in comparison, cutlasses, sticks and stones and those sorts of weapons being used by the blacks who don't have access to that firepower or that skill. So the balance in terms of the number of injured and death would always be higher for the black population. Some whites were injured, mostly wounded by stones and other missiles that went their way. Eight police were injured as well. In the aftermath, we have approximately 334 people were arrested during and shortly after the rebellion. 156 were convicted and they received stiff jail sentences and 178 were acquitted. Now the Dutton brothers, interestingly, who led the assault at the two plantations, Halton and Bide Mill probably escaped according to Henderson Carter because he says that there was no evidence that they were captured. And he hypothesizes that perhaps they escaped with 60 rioters who were going to be arrested on a vessel bound to Trinidad. We see destruction through gutted buildings, burnt fields, dead animals. We noted before that during the different protests at the plantations that potatoes, foodstuff, and animals were stolen. In the aftermath, we see that crops were destroyed, estate houses, outhouses and dwelling houses were attacked. And Carter estimates that 89 estates in nearly every parish were affected with losses with an estimated value damage about $22,000. Now, in general, this rebellion that sought to change the system, that sought to change the regime, failed to overthrow the ruling planter merchant elite. So the purpose of the rebellion was not materialized. Now, Hennessy actually was praised by the colonial office for putting on a rebellion. However, he was transferred to Hong Kong before the end of 1876 and replaced as governor by Captain George Strong. Now Barbados was offered the option to keep the representative system that they had in terms of their political governance on condition that they allowed two members appointed by the Crown to sit in parliament. Now, this was an olive branch, a way of compromise by the colonial office, but the Barbadians rejected the proposal. According to Michael Creighton, let me think about the 1876 Confederation Rebellion. He says the Barbadian regime successfully used the Federation riots as a pretext to retain and reinforce its socioeconomic system. Finally, to defeat the Windward Islands Federation proposal, and pursued a vendetta against Governor Pope Hennessy. Now, the planter class and the merchant elite in Barbados won because Governor Pope Hennessy was transferred out of Barbados. And Barbados never became a crown colony. The island never lost its right to self legislation. And Bermuda and Bahamas and Barbados remained in that way. The planter class, the merchant elite, continued to have control over the political running of Barbados, and that control only um, continued to exist over the economy and society. And the Black working class, who were hoping for change under the Confederation system, and who wanted to have improved way of life for themselves and their families, had to continue to endure that oppressive system and dire socioeconomic conditions in the island. Now, when we talk about this rebellion, it is important to think about the importance of the masses and their political awareness and their independence. They were aware that politically the island was divided. They were aware that this was an opportune time to perhaps get change. And they organized themselves into these different groups and they had leadership because they realized that they could capitalize on this breakdown among the ruling elite in Barbados and hopefully 
have a political change that would improve their socioeconomic conditions because they knew that it could not happen if the current system of the old representative system and the planned class being in charge would remain. But in the end, Governor Hennessy, their professed champion, countered their political consciousness and political action by calling out the military to put down the 1876 rebellion. So today in our discussion, we would have mentioned what the 1876 rebellion was, where it was held in Barbados, and the underlying factors for this rebellion leading to poor socioeconomic conditions and the confederation politics. We also noticed some of the events that transpired in the rebellion in terms of different estates that were attacked, the leadership, how the government or the governor responded to this particular rebellion. And we know the devastation that it caused. We know death, destruction. And then in the end, we also know that the rebellion did not effect change as the Black working class wanted it to do. They did not overthrow the system and the planter class were able to remain in the same vein under the old representative system and did not become a crown colony as the colonial office would have wanted. Here are some resources that you can use to do further reading on this topic. Thank you. Thank you for watching and continue to tune in to Let's Talk History for more informative topics on history in the West Indies and history in general. We want to wish you all the best in your upcoming exams. Thank you.